Uh, welcome to a live version of CRM Audio, and I, really this isn't that much different than what we normally do because we're usually live when we're recording, but uh, we put the link out there, and if anyone is anyone wants to join us and ask your questions, yeah, we have we have that open right now. If not, we've got plenty of other stuff to talk talk about. So we got uh, we got we got all the bases covered here. We got. Uh, George Dubinsky in Sydney, where it's morning time. Myself, Joel Lindstrom in South Carolina, where it's evening time. And then let's see, we got Ulrich. And where are you, Ulrich? I am in the North Bay, north of San Francisco. Cool. And we got Daryl Labar, Mr. Indianapolis there. Yes, sir. And uh, Stephen Smith. And uh, first off, Stephen is the newest business applications MVP as of uh, about 12 hours ago. So maybe not even that long. I've been MVP. Congratulations. So how has your life changed today, Stephen? I'm walking around a little bit more uh, with a puffy chest, you know, shoulders back kind of feeling, you know, so can't complain. I'm still, it's still kind of surreal though. Yeah. You know, because I totally forgot about it. It wasn't easy. So, uh, so you probably have, you know, some people now who wouldn't give you the time of the day a few days ago will now talk to you. <laughs> and yes, the you women know, really love the MVP status. <laughs> <laughs> and people will, people will uh, think you actually know something now. Yes, yes, yes. If they didn't before, now they really will. All right. So um, I, I didn't plan anything, but is there anything we should do to, I don't know, initiate or haze Stephen into the group? I, I want to welcome Stephen because this this meeting is actually the first time I'm not the newest MVP in the group, so <laughs> ah, it's, it's <okay>. awesome. <laughs> yes, not nice. old timers like me and George. Yeah. George, I can't remember. Were, were you re, were you awarded the same year as me? I was 2008. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. that's going yeah. going back a long time. I had a, I had a funny. I had a funny uh, thing happen at work yesterday. Funny, funny me anyway. It was um, something about uh, somebody dug up a tip of the day from like five years ago about the sort order in uh, lookup fields, not honoring the sort order of the lookup, the lookup view. And in that view, in that in that tip, we had said, quoting somebody from Microsoft, that it's in the roadmap to fix it. Well, it still works that way now. So. <laughs> and I had my response, they said, when's that update coming? I said, um, this was five years ago. I don't think it's coming. Yeah. How long did it take to fix not in <laughs> close? And, uh, yeah, we do occasionally get uh, comments like tip 27 or whatever. Your tip is shit. It doesn't work. Well, of course it doesn't because it was for 2011 or something like that. <laughs> I always find it funny people who think we still care about tips after we publish them. <laughs> Once they're published, out of sight, out of mind. We've moved on to the next tip. So we have a number of really interesting news stories to talk about. Um, first one, I guess the, the biggest one on a lot of people's minds is the power component framework, um, if that's what we're calling it today. <laughs> so, who here has written a power control, a power component so far? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Easy, okay. Which one? <laughs> I Daryl, you, you've turned out about ten of them by now, probably. I have a grand total of zero so far. Uh <laughs> no, I think Joel. I think you you mixing up two things, as uh, most people will do at some point. You mix in components in canvas apps and power apps component framework yeah which is for creation of uh, custom controls no that's what i'm talking about Jordan. i'm talking about the custom controls which don't work in power apps yet i'm talking about i'm talking about the controls i want to see the i want to see the on, rush, the rush yeah, yeah. of controls, cool controls that we to were supposed to get when this you. came out yeah but to confuse you there is a uh canvas com there are canvas components which is basically a mashup of the existing controls that you can package. Okay. Um, I've got the so, links. So what you're saying, George, is you haven't written any yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've got cool samples, which I didn't write, but uh, yeah, I've got I've got samples. I've got samples. So are you um, 
I, you I did write Hello World. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> Are you retooling uh, the, the bad master class now that this is out, George? Uh, we did show it. Uh, um, we did show it uh, last time, uh, but just a demo. So this time around, uh, yes, we are in, uh, we are going to include um, the whole module on kind of uh, uh, developing uh, new new age developing on on the client. So creating components and. Uh, controls and what's not and uh, can reusing things uh, a bit of typescript uh, yes and the next one is um, coming to hawaii so we uh, straight hawaii. after bass yes straight after uh, bass do they have, have dynamics in hawaii or you just want to go to beautiful matter, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, basically we're gonna be there it's halfway between america and uh, asia so if people come in from australasia um don't feel like flying 27 hours straight and have a break in hawaii is your option so you fly to uh it's about uh, say from sydney it's about 10 hours to honolulu and about oh, wow. 10 hours to atlanta so um it's mm. actually a good good flight so good stopover uh do some stuff on weekend and uh, on thursday friday we teaching and uh yeah then have a break uh but to top it up we now have mad workshop in addition to mad. that class. Wow. Uh, uh basically a lot of people uh, who are not developers uh, managers and uh, project uh, managers and uh, other people up the food chain so they a bit confused about the developers and citizen developers and what's not so we have a, like a half a day workshop telling them how to deal with those uh, with so is one of the topics and, when you should fire your developers uh, yes can you no it's called <laughs> can you fire your developers now um, and I'm not telling the answer. You, okay. you have to come and join. <laughs> so, uh, so the people who are more developers than me, which is most of you, um, can you explain to me and any non-developer listeners what's the difference between a power control and a web resource? No, I haven't created a single. I haven't created a single one of these things, so this is going from what I know of it. But the mm -hmm. the power control is supposed to be tied to an actual attribute of some sort or to like a grid of some sort. Where a web uh, resource, am I wrong? Help me out, George. What is it? Save me. Save me. Obi no, it you're my only it, hope. it can be bound. It doesn't have to be. There All is right. a. Uh, it can be unbound, uh, so you can draw whatever you like. Okay. Uh, fundamentally, the difference is that your web resource is uh, iframed HTML, right? Yep. So, mm -hmm. uh, like from under the hood, uh, if you open the hood, so uh, it is what it is. So it's injected HTML and iframe. Uh, PCF allows you to effectively go in and extend your uh, DOM, so object model. So you actually live inside uh, the uh, the page. So you you live inside the model driven form, right? Um, going further, I don't know when it's going to happen, but the intent, my understanding is that the intent is to eventually allow that into um, Canvas as well. So effectively, what you create and you create in with JavaScript on the fly or with TypeScript that gets compiled on the fly, you're actually injecting your code or your code is being injected and allows you to modify the surface that you live in. Um, so which creates and it can be obviously bound, it can be unbound, can be bound to the field, can be bound to the data set. Uh, giving you flexibility, can shove and move your data in and out, uh, and it behaves the same way. So the forms, the house and form, understand what you're talking about. So it's kind of uh, integrated world uh, we we live in, but obviously tapping it directly into the um, 
into DOM of the form gives you a greater flexibility. But obviously with that uh, and greater power, and with that comes responsibility. So obviously it will be very easy to kind of uh, nuke your form out of the existence by creating uh, ill-behaved controls. So, so okay, so, yeah, so with, that in mind, with that in mind, George, here's the question. Do you still write web resources or can you, for visual control, visual things on the form, do you switch everything to PCF? Uh, moving forward, I would say PCF will be the way to go. So, okay. uh, and, and isn't isn't the difference? I mean, like, like I I look at the original custom visual controls they had, like my favorite, the flip switch or the editable grid. You know, one difference is those are controls that I can put basically within within reason. I can replace, say, instead of the bit field or the the two option field show the flip switch wherever I want, or instead of this view on this entity, when I'm on my phone, show show that. So, you know, it's it's a level of reusability that web resources don't have, right? Uh, correct, and moving forward, hopefully it will extend to, I don't know, I'm dreaming here. Um, I have nothing to support it, NDA or no NDA. But uh, imagine if you have uh, a control that can leave it in model driven or canvas or God forbid portals. Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, so uh, we have some new people. We have we have an audience um, joining us now are Steve Mordu and Scott Sewell. Hi there. Just want to see how you're doing. How you guys are doing? Yeah. So now 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 the Microsoft cops are here. Now we got to. <laughs> That's right. I'm. Okay. I'm I'm here as an NDA police officer, so uh, <laughs> just uh, and then and then the more dues here, that? more more dues here to complain about it. So I don't know. <laughs> so um, next topic, and you know, Steve and Scott, feel feel free to join in this discussion. So here, this is a comment that came from somebody in Fast Track, and again, I, I wasn't in the conversation, and so this is kind of kind of saying it, but to to the level to the, basically. There's not a lot of investment happening with virtual entities. You remember virtual entities, the big hoopla with uh, V9 about connecting to the data sources. That's kind of died out because now we have embedded Canvas apps with all the snazzy connectors and all that. So question for you, would you still use virtual entities? I mean, thinking about this, there's a lot of things where embedded Canvas apps make a lot of sense. If there's a connector for it, check. If if you uh, want to interact with it, create records in that other source, but there's some capabilities that you have with uh, with virtual entities, such as the ability to um, do advanced finds, create notes against it, those types of things, where it's it's of of value. So I guess the question, just to throw at you, if you were seeing a need with a customer where a virtual entity might fit, would you feel confident using it, or would you move away from it? There's, I think there's two separate problems that they're trying to solve, uh, you could solve with that. The virtual entity, you can treat it like it's a real life entity and do, have it show up in the grid, have it show up here, have it show up there, where the Canvas app, you're having to push it wherever the heck you want it, one at a time. And so it's just really dependent on what kind of experience you're wanting your end user to have. Uh, you know, obviously the, the Canvas app is going to be more pretty and more focused on exactly whatever you want to do in that specific instance but it's going to lose out in some of the functionality of, of looking like a real live entity within CRM itself or within CDS itself. Yeah. And I, I you know, it's virtual entities are not deprecated. And uh, I think David Yak made the comment that, you know, plugins aren't seeing a lot of changes either, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use plugins. Yeah, yeah I agree with that as well. And I think, I think that, I think the big reason that virtual entities haven't seen as much use by people is because it wasn't exactly what they were hoping it would be. I think they were hoping to have some editability of these read-only things, and it wasn't just read-only data. I think they want to be able to edit it as well. So I think that's where the um, I think that's really where you're going to see the big push to use a Canvas app where you can actually edit the data versus uh, virtual entity where it's read-only. Yeah, uh, Steve, I, I see you there, and you're muted right now. But um, do you have any thoughts on this? Is you're doing your your force works or other solutions? You know, would you use a virtual entity? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I don't know that I would. We hadn't gotten to the point where we started using those. That's deep. And it, 
<laughs> and it kind of feels like they're moving away yes. from them. So I probably, probably wouldn't start down that path now. What do you think? The other Steve, Steve, Steve too. Now I can't say MVP Steve because Steven's an MVP as well now because of yeah. today. So what do you think, Steven? Um, I'm not, I, I look at virtual entities, which we used to just do with plugins before it was actually called virtual entities. Uh, for more specialized use cases, I, I tend to not like them just in general um, for the fact of uh, latency. So I've had customers who've been insistent on trying to use uh, virtual entities to query from uh, online to on-prem, uh, which I vehemently was against because, you know, especially if you're starting to create like fetch queries where you're joining to a virtual entity, that has data on prem, you're just looking at a lot of issues. Um, but in general, the times that I have considered virtual entities, uh, the data would be, for example, right next to the, the CRM system, whether that was on prem or online. So if it was online, that data would need to be somewhere in Cosmos DB or SQL Azure or something like that. But I haven't really had a lot of instances where I've wanted to use those. Okay. So I so I think I think around. we I think we heard like half and half. I think some I think the takeaway would be in some cases we 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 would consider them, but it's worth considering. And if you can do it, it um, because I mean one thing I found is with a with a Canvas app, if you can get the data to a collection, it can be faster than working with it from the other other system if there's latency. So I think it's worth considering and not. Use common sense, I think, is the answer. That's our that's the motto, right, George? It's a uh, uh, trademark, so stop using it. <laughs> no, it, it is, but to, to Daryl's point, uh, if it was a little more feature rich, I think they'd be a lot more usable than having to do the work to format data into that, you know, special virtual entity format and all that. Yeah, yeah it's a little, little more plug and play. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, look, to be honest, a lot of us been doing equivalent of virtual entities for a long time. It's just uh, uh, standardizing the way data is fiddled with, uh, using technical term, inside the plugins. So um, I think fundamentally there were some inconsistencies how the uh, how they were architectured, but moving forward, I see some of the things coming in the shape of connectors, which uh, brings me to actually a slightly different topic. Um, it's about uh, flowing the data through, let's put it this way. So connector would allow you to flow the data through. So if uh, in the shape and form that you want, which is effectively what virtual entities do, uh, and you just consume it on the other end. Uh, like a sausage factory. So, which brings me interest, uh, to the topic I know nothing about, and uh, uh, maybe Ulrich can answer. Uh, data flows, they were pitched as the next best thing, and then kind of everything is quiet, and we don't hear much about it. What's happening yeah, this, there? This should be when, when Ulrich and Scott Sewell jump up and grab the pitch. Yeah, like, what, what the virtual mean? entity, use a data flow and embed a Power BI dashboard, right? <laughs> Right. So the, the functionality that would be is, is very different. Data flows would be a, a data lake that you have as a part of your Power BI subscriptions, where you have all your tables, you do all the transformations, all the querying, and you basically have them ready to go or use for some purpose, which could be dashboards, et cetera, via Power BI inside Dynamics 365. One of the benefits of using data flows, one of the big benefits of using data flows is that you get access to automated machine learning via the data set that you put in there. So if you query all your opportunity data and your activities, et cetera, into the data flow, you can actually automate various machine learning algorithms directly within the data set. You don't have to use it, move it to machine learning studio and so on. You get a lot of benefits from doing that. You also get some different types of refresh rates depending on the subscription that you're on. Um, especially if you are on Power BI Premium, you can get some some fairly fast incremental refreshes on on your data, so you have fairly updated data in your data flow too. 
uh, in comparison to what you have to Power BI. So it doesn't feel really fill in the bucket of saying like you would you go virtual entities or data flows they they do have uh separate separate purposes so i don't know i know scott's been looking into them in them too so he's still on yeah I'm, I'm still here i i don't know that i have any uh any deep experience on power on uh, data flows but uh but i think but uh, to your point elric it's it's a different in a difference in the purpose and i think you're and from like a virtual entity I think that's to me the the thing that was promising about virtual entities was the ability to still act on the data without it living in the database, meaning be able to query it with advanced find or create related records like notes and activities. And so that, you know, I think sometimes maybe a Canvas app plus a virtual entity might be a good fit if you need to give users the ability to query the data. And then you want them to be able to act on it, credit, create it, delete it, whatever. You know, that's that's good. So, um, uh, did you notice, guys, that uh, Scott Sewell actually sitting on uh, the background of Ma Microsoft picture of uh, New York City, right? <laughs> yeah. And when you do that, teams blur the presenter, not the background. Oh, really? <laughs> because Scott comes to me, like blur it most of the time with the crisp background with the very good logo. that's that's not a problem george <laughs> it's a feature all right it's so feature. so um so steve seaboard do i have to say full names here since we have two steves yeah. um talk to us about the um blog post you wrote about microsoft's new answer to app exchange oh well because yeah, that, you know that, we have several people on who are ISVs. You know, you, I'm sorry, guys. I have ISV. to go in about two hours. I read it, but I don't know if I really really understand that. So what what's the big deal? Well, I think if you're not an ISV, it's not a big deal at all. So if you are an ISV, then it would it would impact you, and you need to be thinking about it. You know, Microsoft is. Uh, it's moving towards more of like an Apple closed system eventually around business applications uh, where uh, people who want to participate in that ecosystem like ISVs in particular that have been you know making money on Microsoft for for free for years uh, who've also been complaining for years about the lack of support and help that ISVs get um, you know, with the recent introduction of Googs to take over that team, it looks like he quickly figured out, well, if, if there's no money in it, then nobody's ever going to care. So they've introduced this revenue sharing program for ISVs that, you know, if you want to, if you want to build on our platform, you got to give us a couple of bucks, but we're going to use those couple of bucks to reinvest back into making you successful and solve all the things you've been complaining about for all these years about uh, us not helping you, you know, there was no money in it. So they created some motivation for their team's both co-sell teams as well as the ISV teams to, uh, you know, to make the ISV motion work uh, like it always should have. Um, it's a little controversial at the moment just because it's new to a lot of the ISVs, but this is not new. I mean, this is Salesforce has been doing this forever. It's it's a very common practice with with platforms. Microsoft just hadn't done it yet. I'm uh, working on another post now that'll be out in a couple of days. It kind of does the other side of that, which is what you get for that. Because uh, you know, right now the focus is all about, oh, I got to give you guys some of my money. Uh, but uh, you're not just giving them money to play; you're also getting some benefits. And I'm going to kind of go through an outline. I just had a hour hour call with Anand to flesh out what some of those were, so I was able to really you know make sure people understand what they're going to get in exchange for that. So we'll see. It's a new program. Uh, it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, these benefits that are coming are a lever that they can play with. I don't see them playing with this revenue share. Um, if you listen to the announcement uh, audio that uh, Goog said, uh, he specifically said, you know, if you if your if your if your ISV solution is not installed through AppSource or is not certified in AppSource, even if it's side loaded, uh, we're going to be letting the customer know that hey, you got some freaky software on there that uh, it hasn't been validated by us, so we don't know what it could do and and I think that's going to cause a lot of customers to expect validated software. Microsoft's going to create that as a new minimum threshold, I think, for ISVs, which is good because there's a lot of cowboy ISV junk out there right now. Mm. And uh, the 10 percent, the first level is going to be unavoidable. If you want to if you want to be an ISV in business application with Microsoft, prepare yourself to 
you know, to give them 10% of your ISV revenue, but, you know, lean into the benefits that they're going to give you back and, uh, and uh, see if you can build an ROI on that. I, I, personally, I think you can, but again, I've, I've had lots of thoughts about ISV and app source in the past. It didn't turn out yet. So uh, <laughs> that'll be the key right now is Microsoft doesn't have a good track record here. Uh, what, what, what iteration of an app source app store is this? We had pinpoint then we had marketplace. Then we had, um, App Source, was there any uh, other besides it? Uh, there's been a lot of different iterations and a lot of uh, you know little things that were started by a small part of a team that never got anywhere. But this is this is a pretty coordinated effort. You know, uh, um, Googs is pulling. I mean, he's a pretty high ranking guy pulling all this stuff together. Uh, App Source was Scott Guthrie's idea. It wasn't some. PM somewhere on some team. So it's got it's got sponsorship and leadership behind this thing at, at a pretty high level. It, it didn't have at the ground uh, the leadership. You know, there was one person had responsibility for a little piece over here and another person over here. And Googs is now going to kind of brought in over top of that whole team and said, okay, let's get this, let's make this thing work. So I, yeah, I, I, I think it, it's going to be good for ISVs. Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, the app source on azure side right so the you, you know there is azure side of things yep. and from what i hear things do work perhaps not uh, not exceptionally well but people do publish their stuff on azure and uh, to me the critical difference is that on azure because there is a way to measure consumption and that includes consumption of your app or whatever you created, right? There is a clear model where Microsoft charges consumption and you get in a slice of that consumption that is relevant to your component app or whatever, right? So to me, the fundamental, and I did bring it up during the meeting, to me, one of the fundamental things would be the licensing, and I don't mean licensing, um, as business application licensing, I mean licensing, ISV licensing, and uh, um, uh, monetization model that should come. To me, if AppSource had that, I would jump straight in. I wouldn't hesitate, I wouldn't think twice, because then the burden of the ISV licensing and consumption of my IP uh, is taken over by Microsoft. And I feel happy, you know, this big machine taking care of all the things I really don't want to do, right? I'm in IT business. I'm in IP business. I'm creating stuff. I don't want to sell this stuff. You know well how how good am I at selling <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> so, you know, I would so say I a couple of things. You know, AppSource actually has been very, I mean, not AppSource, but Azure has been very successful marketplace. Matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that, that they're really going down this this path is because they've got a model for Azure that works very well for customers and ISVs. And so they know it can be done. And uh, that's part of what Googs keeps bringing up is how it works over on Azure. You know, Azure is a different buyer. That's a that's a IT buyer. Uh, AppSource is a line of business buyer. So the, the, you know, the, the pitch will be a little different. They'll have to, they can't just replicate exactly what's going on in Azure, but they do want to replicate the success. Uh, to your point, um, you know, commerce is coming. Uh, licensing will be part of commerce, so they will have that that ability at some point in the future. But for now, it's going to be kind of a self-report mechanism. Uh, you know, they're charging you, uh, or they're they're looking for you to pay them 10% of your ISV value. So that doesn't include the underlying license that they're selling them, or or Azure consumption that it's using elsewhere that you're paying for. This is just that 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 that'll be a, a little area that I'm sure will have to get negotiated and fleshed out. Is what am I paying this percentage on? Um, they do have the ability to scan all. And this is online only, by the way. So they may do with any on-premise. So this is strictly for online. They What's do have the premise? ability to. Yeah, <laughs> it's some old thing. Uh, they do have the ability to scan all online environments and identify, uh, you know, solutions that have been installed. Um, so they can they can they can find you uh, if you're out there and. 
So I think one of the comments I heard today, and maybe you guys saw it also, uh, was about, uh, you know, the fact that I, if, I, if I'm putting my app through AppSource and that is successfully creating a sale, I'm all for giving them 10%. But if I got my own sales team or my own channel out there uh, selling direct to customers and AppSource and Microsoft didn't have anything to do with it, I don't think you should have to pay them anything. And I, I, can, see, uh, I can see that point. But, um, and maybe, you know, Microsoft is certainly not, not, not a, afraid to put the cart before the horse sometimes. Like George, you said, they don't have commerce yet. They don't have licensing yet, but we're going to start putting this model in place. And maybe another way they could have approached it was said, you know, we're going to put this model in place for app source so we can prove to you guys that we can perform, you know, our end of the deal. Uh, and then we'll roll it out across everything. They might have, you know, being a little aggressive here with, no matter how your app gets in, you have to pay us whether you use our resources or not. But uh, we'll, we'll see where some of that stuff shakes out. We're at the we're at the scream and, and, and cry mode at the moment of people just seeing something new. We actually have to wait for that to settle down, let it sink in, the reality of what's happening. And then, then I think we'll start getting really more intelligent feedback from ISVs about what they really would like to see in the way of benefits and what's of value and what isn't. Uh, but we're we're it's still a little while away from that calming down. Yeah, so I think we I think we've post, hit our uh, I think George George we've hit our licensing and ISB quota for this episode. So. <laughs> no, no, I, I want I want. I'm boring myself. This, uh, five stages. Of, Scott's just uh, sitting there uh, saying I can't talk adults. about any of this stuff. Um, Steve, <laughs> sorry, I was watching post? him nodding his head. <laughs> so, Steve, do you have the post about five stages of app source adoption? Like currently we're in anger state, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I call it the scream stage, but yeah, we're. I have a comment here, a question here on what, what this actually is going to mean to people and customers who are using Dynamics or using AppSource, because I'm also looking at the marketplace inside Power BI, for example, where you can go in and download all the custom visuals that people make available that have been certified and so on. And uh, fair enough, it, it is now possible to charge money for those custom visuals you want to use inside your report. What um, what I have a little bit of an issue with is you can actually have a free version of your visual with in-app purchases if you want to get access to the full full custom visual, which starts sounding very much like, you know, whatever games it is that your your kid downloads on your iPhone with all these in-app purchases to get like additional costumes and whatnot. And I think that road is it doesn't sound as conducive as it should be because that also means you're gonna get a lot of those basically crap free applications which sole purpose is, is advertising for the paid version whereas there's actually no benefit necessarily in using the uh, the free version so I'm, I'm a little cautious about how that side of it is gonna gonna end up because it sounds like we may may get a lot of clutter in the in the app source which is not i guess not so you you'll have you a worried little... about the you worried about the fart app version of the power bi <laughs> control yeah right, right? <laughs> well, you'll have a little bit of time because Power BI is not part of this program yet. Uh, they're not pulling Power BI into this rev sh share yet. Uh, that doesn't mean they won't, but it's not. they're not doing it right now. But you're right. I mean, part of the problem with AppSource is it was just this big cesspool of broken, unsupported, abandoned right. junk. And uh, you know, they're going to go through a process of recertifying everything in there, which will automatically clear out. Frankly, I think two-thirds of what's in there, at least, is going to be gone. Um, and then it'll be up to them where they let it just fill back up with crap again that just happens to be able to meet certification. Uh, it's almost like they need two bars. They need to, your app is, is technically sound, but it's also worthy. Uh, I don't think they're thinking about getting into the worthy determination business, but at least technically sound. Right. Right. So uh, kind of on that note, more marketing. Yeah, I don't know if you've if you've noticed if you have if you've been in like the Flow or Power Apps or Power BI desktop, you've seen the little pop up that says business applications summit is coming, and it's kind of annoying after a while. But anecdotally, I have I have evidence that their marketing strategy is effective because my sister, who is not technical in the least, she's an accountant. She started doing some Power BI reports. And she saw that, and so now she's registered for the Business Application mm -hmm. Summit. Nice. So it shows that they're doing, and just anecdotally, if she's signing up, there's they got to be driving some attendance through that, and that's smart for them to leverage that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not a partner focused event like some of their others. This one is a user. I mean, we're all welcome, but this is their user user event. So it doesn't surprise me that they're getting a little more overt to reaching out to users. And with that yeah, message. it's interesting. They have the pop ups inside of, you know, the the maker experience for Power Apps, Flow, and Power BI. I haven't seen anything pop up inside Dynamics, you know, and that's that's interesting. I guess since the maker experiences are coming together, that will be the maker experience for it. Oh, we got till June. They may be ramping that up between now and then too. And yep. I see pop ups for local like dashboards in a day uh, seminars too. So they had, I think she said 6,000 last year. They're expecting double this year. So 12,000 people. That's a pretty good chunk of people. They got to get them from somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's going to be users, I guess. It makes sense. I'm not going to be able to go this year. So I'm sending my sister in my place. No, 11,999 <laughs> 11, then. Yeah. <laughs> are, the are the rest of you going to BizApp Summit? I'll be there. Not sure, but I hope so. Maybe. I'm not planning to be there. That's the question is, what are you doing at uh, Build? Oh, you didn't see the news? It's a citizen developer com conference this year. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of citizen developer content along with along with um, developer content. So I'm actually going to some Power BI educational sessions because I figure I can't let Ulrich have all the cool tips and tricks. Has, has some, Build some been user facing stuff. before? I thought. It I don't know if I ever no, thought of build as user facing. You no, know, it's it's a developer contest, but they're broadening the definition of developer to include more citizen developers, not end users, but more IT IT pros and light developers. And if you look at the like there was a post that, that was shared today, I think Charles Lamano shared it. It's basically case studies of real people, not developers who have built apps. Some of it was Power Apps, so one was Power BI, one was some guy who, you know, has cancer and he's building his own building a website about, you know, fighting cancer. And so it's and it was in relation to build. And uh, the point was that developer is broader than coders. It's also people making making apps. So yeah, so I'm going and part of what reason I'm going is <clears throat> because you know, I wasn't able to go to MVP Summit. I'm not going to be able to go to, to BizApp Summit. So I need to get to I need to get to Seattle so they don't uh, forget I'm here. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you just told you just told Daryl he's not a real person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, d developer developer snobs, right, George? <laughs> I think that was the term I used on on, on tip of the day. So, uh, so on that topic. Um, what does it mean with the uh, connectors for a power platform are going open source? And, and Steve, I think you 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 educate me a little bit that it's not all connectors. It's just the Microsoft controlled ones. Not if somebody, you know, the, the example is that George has used numerous times as SurveyMonkey. He wants to use SurveyMonkey and there's a connector, but it stinks. Is that the word? You yeah, use? And, and you know, we, uh, George and I had looked into some of this previously on some stuff. You know, the one of the requirements they have for connectors, at least public connectors like that, is you have to own the API. So, for example, and there may be some workarounds, but on its on its face, it means that George couldn't build a Mailchimp connector and offer it. The only people that could could do that would be Mailchimp. So, obviously, Microsoft built. Uh, some of the first connectors, they built the Salesforce connector. They built, uh, you know, to kind of seed that market. I, so I think that they'll they'll open source all the ones they built uh, that weren't ultimately taken over by the vendor because some of the ones they built were then taken over by the vendors. But, you know, they're not going to go open sourcing some vendor ISVs public connector that they got approved. It's really not their IP to open source. So I'm expecting to So let me ask you a question about stuff. that. Where's the line in the crazy embedded world we have now where you know, your solution for dynamics can have a canvas app embedded in it your power bi dashboard could have a custom connector to mailchimp and have a power app embedded in that and you could package that in in some kind of a solution can you sell it in that context if it's not a reusable component that somebody can take and build something new could i sell an, an isv solution that has Power app, Canvas app embedded in it that I've extended or, or built my own connector to Mailchimp. 
So first of all, you couldn't build your own connector to Mailchimp. Well, you you could as a private. There's connector. an API if I build as a, a private as connector. A, can as I a private connector. That into. Uh... I wouldn't see why not because that's your IP. Um, you know, it was, may not do people any good if they don't have a Mailchimp account because you know you'd need to be able to connect. They would need to be able to ultimately connect to that. We're waiting for the. Oh, they just gave us a new term for it. They were calling it parameters for a while, and they just were talking recently about the new term. But basically, it's this common. has been. A, this has been the piece that's been missing for packaged ISV solutions to be able to use things like Flow or embedded Canvas apps or any of these connectors is that, uh, you know, you could pull them onto your solution, publish it, and go, you know, install it on a customer's instance, and none of that stuff's going to work because you weren't able to pass through any of the any of the parameters, if you will, to activate those things. So this new, and uh, uh, I'm frustrated, I can't remember the term for it, but, but they were just talking about it, but they're going to be giving us the ability to to be able to do that, where it could be packaged up. They're solution aware now, which I think means it works fine if you're going from dev to, to test to prod, but not if you're publishing and then going to some customer's tenant and installing, it, it kind of falls apart there without these parameters, but we're close. We're close so, to that. So Daryl. I would be interested to know, uh, Hold on, I've got a question for Daryl as well. So I have. A I would be interested to know. <laughs> you've spoken first, but I thought about it first. So I would be interested to know how packaging custom connector would affect certification and app source because kind of it's the way to sneak it in, right, for the customer. Um, but is Microsoft again to point finger and say, "Hey, hold on, you don't own the API. Stop right there." So uh, that's the interesting story kind of with custom connectors. But for Daryl, um, as a developer uh, here, the real one, um, what does <laughs> open source, open sourcing connectors mean for you as developer who works for customers and develop something? You had the same question for Daryl that I did. And my question, and, and <laughs> My flavor on that is I get your motivation for publishing things to the community, for publishing things to XARM Toolbox or building your own open source tools. But what is the motivation for a developer to contribute to an open source connector for a commercial product like Flow, for example? The really only benefit that I see developers having in that is if they are actively using it and finding an issue with it or something that they need to improve their client. And that's where that that the, the the beauty of that is, oh, this isn't working because of yada, 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 or, hey, I need to connect to my own custom thing that's very similar to this. How do I go and grab that and then fork it to what I actually want to use it for? So I see those as being the two primary benefits of it being open source. But as far as a developer going out and open sourcing and creating something for another vendor, that, that guess maybe that might happen if they go and they create it internally for a customer because they can't sell that. They can't give that away to because Microsoft says, no, 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 they can't do that. But you might be able to say, hey, I've created it for you. You guys can go no, ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm saying like there. if they open source the CDS connector for Flow or whatever. And so, you know, you go in and you 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 do a poll and you you write something. Would you be motivated to do that to contribute to that since it's a connector for a commercial product? Or would you would you spend your time you know, writing your own for your own development purposes? I'll let me rephrase that, uh, Daryl. What do you think the chances are Microsoft is going to take the pull request from you? Well, they just took my pull request on the docs, so that's a start, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a missing comma. Pull Did request. Did you fix the spelling here? Uh, Microsoft is still a, still a major software company, so they have the same software struggles that all the other customers out there, all the other companies out there have. So if the pull request is valid and it helps solve an issue or make something better, I, I don't know why they wouldn't take it. Uh, the primary issue there is just how inundated they would get. I don't think they're going to get too inundated with community requests to, to go through. Either things are going to work or they're not going to work. And um, if it doesn't work, someone's going to go out and help them resolve that issue. So, so I, what, I've what's been, driving what's driving this? Is it, you know, we're not getting enough connector change fast enough. We want to we want to explode that. Or is it is it good PR or is it both? What do you I think? think it's is, cheap, I think it's cheap development doc, uh, developer documentation. Yeah, and I, I would also, you know, they built a bunch of these connectors, right? And some of them weren't all that great. They only had a, you know, one or two actions, one trigger. They, didn't, they weren't robust connectors. And now they've got, 
you know, 250 of them floating out there, a lot of them that they've controlled. And they're getting requests from all over the place from everybody. Hey, I need this trigger. I need that action. So I think it, in a way, it's kind of turned into a burden uh, for them uh, to, to do that. So for them to open source it and say, hey, let's let smart guys like Daryl go fix all these these connectors and add to them and extend them. I mean, I think Microsoft's the biggest beneficiary of, of open sourcing their connectors. Right. And I think, I mean, having covered this for the daily brief where we run out of news and so I got to dig into what connectors are new. Um, some surprising things. Uh, have you been paying attention? What's the biggest types of connectors that have been introduced in the last two months? Category. Just a test? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have no clue. Blockchain. Oh, there's boy. all these blockchain providers, and it's like I know there's a, there are a dime a dozen, but are people you know are they mining bitcoins? Are they using it for uh, development purposes? And I mean, every now and then somebody signs up at CMUG for you know use blockchain with your CRM deployment, but I've never seen. I think for transactional stuff like F and O and where you got, you know, that type of thing, it makes sense in, in cases, but, you know, it's interesting to see that it seems heavy on the blockchain, but they've had, you know, they slowed down for a while. And I think, agree with you, Steve, I think they wrote most of the initial ones, including the Salesforce connector, but then it's, it's picked up and you got a, you got a momentum going now where they added something like 10 or 10 plus in April. And so, you know, just a proportion wise, it is, it is, you know, some nice movement. And I was, I've been surprised going through, going through the common, common ancillary systems that we come across, like Zendesk, ServiceNow, Salesforce, all these. There's connectors for them now, and Jira, and they're they're pretty good. And so, you know, now that you can do better cannabis apps, it's really the way that I approach integrations for those types of systems has totally changed from what we were doing two years ago. So the value is the value is clear. And you know, hopefully this will this will spur. But well, I think I think part of the reason it's growing too is you know we we have a tendency those of us on the call to kind of look thing, through things through our biz apps lens. But you know, flows goes well beyond biz apps. Um, you know, there's a whole side, there's a whole office, so there's a ton. To, I mean, that's probably the first step um, uh, citizen developer tool is flow. It's the easiest one to gauge with, the easiest one to use. You got you got citizens out there using Flow to connect uh, third-party services to other third-party services, uh, not even worrying about Dynamics. So that's a much bigger ecosystem than Biz Apps alone. So it doesn't surprise me that you know they seeded it a little bit, but now you know there's people calling from all directions for more connectors mm -hmm. uh, that don't have anything to do with uh, Biz Apps. Flow is the gateway drug to the power platform because. Absolutely. I've been looking at customers we have that are getting deep into Power Platform. Almost all of them started with a flow. It's usually an approval flow. And yep. then their yep. eyes open so, the connectors and then then they add to it. So it's a Trojan horse. <laughs> exactly. Modern day can, access. Just, uh, can I take another spin on explaining what does it mean? Um, you all heard about .NET, right, Charles? You've heard of .NET Framework. I think you have no. to have like .NET 2.5 installed to install CRM version 4 or something. Yeah, yeah, that, that <laughs> I just, one. I just ask yeah. Daryl, whenever he brings that up, I'll just ask Daryl. .NET Core and things like that. Well, guess what? If you go to github.com forward slash .NET forward slash core, here's your open source for .NET framework. So the entire framework is open source. So, like what, Microsoft is concerned that someone's going to steal it? No, it's, uh, uh, Daryl put it, yeah, quite nicely. It's a cheap dev docs. And uh, if something doesn't work, you can dive deep and fix it up. Do they accept pull requests? Uh, I'd be curious. Uh, pull request three on .NET Core. <laughs> You'd think that would be more, right? Um, but I, I will say it's kind of kind of interesting, uh, like the templates. If you go look at the CDS or Dynamics 365 templates, they actually show the usage count. There's not a single one that had over 100 uses. Most of them were in the single or small double digits. So it's uh, I, I, I use agree templates with you. just to see, to see to <laughs> see how it's done. 
um, not to actually use in production. So when I'm building production flow, I start from blank. Yeah, most so, of the time. So I and so we have a number of customers that use use Power Platform. I had my first what I would call major flow solution move over the, the last couple of days. Of moving from we've done I've moved flows, but probably one at a time. But I this like is a process. Joel saying I have my major flow now. <laughs> so, but here's the thing: I I fully fully learned that putting flows in Canvas apps and solutions isn't great. I mean, the idea is great, and I was I was all about I'm going to do this in a solution. And now that it's here, but what I realized is you put in the solution. If you delete that solution, you can't find your flow anywhere. I mean, maybe you can, but it's it's not clear where 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 it would be. If you want to say, okay, now I want my managed service support person to help this. He or she has to dig up the solution, the flows in, and find it to edit it there. So I, I took it out of the solution and moved them one at a time. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Neil Benson was saying something here recently about he'll start using Flow and recommend using Flow with his you know enterprise important critical deployments once all the complaints about all the issues and tweaks and little fiddles with Flow are gone. And you know, if you're going to use Flow as a citizen developer to create some little notification when something happens, and if it doesn't happen, then it isn't the end of the world. Then you know, knock yourself out with Flow. But if you're going to build ISV solutions or mission critical uh, enterprise level solutions, I think I'm kind of with Neil. I'm going to I want to wait until the, the the complaining about this thing doesn't work or when I do that it doesn't do this that that stuff dies down before I would I would feel comfortable with it. Well, I don't see how you totally get away from that complexity when you got more than one connector in it. If it's yeah. self-contained in dynamics like a workflow, it's pretty solid. And I mean, I've the flow I've had flows that I've updated 50,000 plus records with and they've all succeeded beautifully, very dependably runs day in day out, doesn't shut off like it did 2 years ago. Uh, but if you have multiple connectors there's just built-in complexity where when you bring it in you have to choose should i update the existing one should i create a new one should i you know what's the connection string to this azure service and that other azure service and it's it's just a natural complexity that i don't i don't know how you get to that being more automated if you're kind of bringing your own that kind of makes me appreciate why they roll out the ai for sales or AI for customer service they don't have you know bring your own azure SKU or Azure key, they just have it all seamlessly work. And I think that's the that's the way to make it more of a seamless product. Well, we, the step we've taken with our ISV solutions is we, uh, up until recently, deactivated Flow uh, so that users using our solutions couldn't use Flow because we didn't want to introduce problems for us to have to deal with. Uh, so we're not creating any flows as part of our solution, although there are some workflows, but we have reactivated the button for them to be able to create their own flows and just said, yeah. you know, citizen, knock yourself out. And we don't want to limit you because you're hearing all this great stuff. But, you know, we're all on the DLs and we're on the, uh, I assume you guys are on the Power Apps DL as well. And there's there's still every day some issue and the team's coming back with, yep, that's a problem we'll go fix. Um, the DL goes to a different folder on my, it's like a, a pool next door that I occasionally stick my foot into. But when I had all those emails, especially when they, 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 when we became business applications, suddenly boom, we had Power BI, Power Apps, FNO. Flow, FNO, Business Central, whatever that thing is. You know, I have all this stuff yep. coming, coming in. I just had to like create a rule. It's got like 1200 on red emails. It's kind of cool though. It's like I ask, a question, then I'll dip back in and see if somebody answers it. And I'll occasionally once a week stick my head in there, see if anybody's mad. The, the, the good thing is usually if somebody's throwing throwing uh, throwing bombs or complaining about stuff, usually I hear the echoes of it and can go in and pop the yeah. popcorn and, and watch the fun. It is another repository that you can go search on to, even if you're not watching it every day and paying attention and staying up to speed. You know, there's thousands now of of uh, messages in there and it's a great archive to go search sometimes for something you're you're trying to figure out yeah so um so let's see we're at the end of our time but steven smith you still there yes you're i am in the audience mode all right so since you <laughs> yeah. know since 
not everybody was here at the beginning of the podcast. And that since Stephen is the baby MVP, do we have any advice for him? <laughs> <laughs> Make a name for yourself and, and, and complain about something. Like send an email saying uh, this licensing is totally, totally terrible. I want to send out <laughs> a, a blog that gets copied throughout Microsoft and talked about like some people. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great move for a new MVP. Yes. I, so yeah, yeah. I, I'll give you a little story. I did that when I first became an MVP, <laughs> and I got a friendly email from this guy named Joel Lindstrom saying, uh, <laughs> more or less, hey, newbie, <laughs> you, you might want to watch your tone if you want to stay an MVP very long. Well, yeah, you know, that, remember that, Joel? <laughs> I do. It was about the, it was about the out, Outlook client, and I think I was a little bit more yeah. friendly to the Outlook app than you were. But yes. I, So, Steve, Steve, since you brought that up, have you warmed up to the app for Outlook, or you still see gaps in it compared to the Outlook client? So, uh, uh, oh, which one are you asking? Yeah, any Steve can answer this question. <laughs> I'll let Steve go. He doesn't talk much. No, no, no. I, I haven't really actually done a lot of work with the uh, app for Outlook yet, so my uh, perspective, perspective is a little shallow on that one. So the most exciting thing in the app for Outlook, for from my perspective, is they're soon to be releasing a version that'll work on CDS uh, without first-party apps. Nice. Uh, up to now, as you know, in order to get it installed, you had to those bits came in with one of the first-party apps, so they're They've separated that out. Uh, as a matter of fact, got it on one of our test environments here, trying to flesh out some issues with it where you could basically build a custom uh, Outlook app to match your custom uh, Power App uh, model-driven uh, solution. Nice. Uh, so so for us, we're excited because you know we, we've shifted everything under the stack. So all of our ISV solutions run on P2. And that was one of those missing features uh, that we've been, we've been clamoring for. So yeah, pretty excited about it. Yeah, I mean, to, not to a me, fan of the, the comment in it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, to to me, the biggest thing is, um, the biggest thing is the rollout and upkeep of it is so much easier. I mean, and I've seen so the fact you can set up so you uh, you add users and enable them for service service. I think it automatically pushes out. I remember just the weeks of turmoil we would have around the comment end and just how how terrible it is. The biggest downside to it is it's. In, on desktop reliance on Internet Explorer. Because I don't know about you, but it, on Windows 10, I cannot open up IE without script errors. It's just so outdated and so laggy and bad. And the fact that the core of Office uses IE as its rendering, it's not an Outlook add-in thing, it's, a, it's an Office thing. And I know that Microsoft is trying to change that, such as moving to Chromium on Edge and moving away from Which is IE. very good, by the way. Have you tried oh, that? Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. It's it my is. default browser and everything. Same here. So same here. That's what I, I think see it was you that had said. It. I think it was you that I that had said a while back that your customers that never had the the Outlook desktop app love the Outlook app, yeah. but the ones that had the old one are the ones that are, weren't as happy with it because they gotten used to something different and they're not the same thing they're not intended to be the same thing um but those that have never seen the old one you know, love the new one right here's my here's my prediction teams has a risk of becoming the new outlook client because like outlook or, it's or got desire. all these add-ins <laughs> you know including crm going into it and it's quickly becoming slow and bloated and you know could definitely reach that point where it's crumbles under its weight kind of like outlook did so i hope it doesn't but uh you know i find if you don't do upkeep like turn off the teams you're no longer part of and don't let the channels build up and everything it, it quickly becomes trying to be that one stop place you do everything soon it becomes I, I loved I love teams. I just I just see a lot of similarities. And I've had customers who once they see the integration without with dynamics, want to have everybody do everything through teams. And I was cautioned a little bit about against that, knowing from having nightmares about the customers that said, you know, we want everybody to just use Outlook. Yeah, I guess having everything in one place sounds like a great thing, but having everything in one place means everything's in one big pile. Um, and it's not necessarily as good as it always sounds trying to wade through all that stuff that is in one place. Sometimes it's nicer to have my emails over here in another place. You know? 
Yeah, if the Swiss Army knife was was the perfect weapon, why isn't the Swiss Army run, running everything these days? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and you never see a slasher movie where the guy's using a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> He's always got like a bayonet or something, you know? Exactly. It's, not, it's just not efficient for slashing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's a violent end to the podcast. <laughs> you want to you want to you promote? Um, everybody's. I mean, we're MVPs, of course. We want to promote something. I'll be at Build next week. Um, so if you uh, drop me a line, love to get together. I'm going to try and get some stickers or something to hand out to people who stop by. Um, George, at, uh, you brought, uh, George already promoted his, his bad class. What about you, Steve? I'll be up at uh, Dynamics 365 Saturday Philly. Um, and then I think after that, uh, Business Application Summit. All right. Daryl? I'll be teaching a unit testing class at uh, CRM UG in florida this year and ulrich you've got a podcast coming out tomorrow um all right what's that about so we have a conversation on analytics and field services uh field service so predictive field service um you know calculating when will the various devices actually break down based on the data you get what time of analysis you do there along with which is machine learning algorithms uh, versus what kind of ranking of work orders, which order you should do them in based on you know, tax calculations and so on, and how that matches up against some of the features that Microsoft gives you out of the box. Very cool. Could, could you hook it up to George to see when he's going to break down? <laughs> uh, we can all predict that. <laughs> so, <laughs> Steven Smith, thing. we're talking about vibrations because vibrations are always important in machines. So we need to like hook up something to George or measure his vibrations. I thought you too. had to use temperature for for predictive stuff, right? No, that's just for demos. <laughs> Steven, <laughs> Steven Smith, you got anything big going on? Now that you're an MVP, you got to worry about keeping it. So you got to mm. start contributing. Yeah, I've been in the lab. Uh, for the last few weeks, uh, writing some code on a little project. I've got a couple of projects going on, but nothing I'm uh, publicizing publicly yet. All right. So great. Yeah. This well, this was fun. It's good to see people's faces and a little different twist in what we do, and you know, kind of a surprise of who's going to show up. So that's always fun. So I want to uh, figure out that Sewell background trick. <laughs> that was, uh, but you know, he's gone now.